In this video, we're talking about Positron, an IDE by Posit for data science in both R and Python. In this video, though, the focus is all about the R components within Positron. Please make sure that you have Positron downloaded and you have R installed. That said, when you open Positron for the first time, chances are it's going to default into Python. We can see that this is the case by looking in the upper right-hand side. You'll notice that Python is what's being selected. Instead, what we want to do is we want to click on the Python icon to open a selector, and then we want to drop down to where we see the R interpreter. If we click on the R interpreter, what happens is in the lower left-hand window, we now see our usual R console getting set up and printed out. That's part one. Next, what we want to do is we actually want to modify a little bit about how Positron is functioning. On the same repository where you downloaded Positron from, there is a wiki tab. On this wiki tab, one of the pages is relating to keyboard shortcuts or how Posit, as the developer of Positron, views the most important tasks that you're going to be doing again and again and again every single day to actually have a key binding or a keyboard shortcut that will allow you to accomplish the task fast. So one of the things to jumpstart your productivity if you're coming from RStudio is to allow the RStudio key mapping to take place instead of using here VS Code key bindings. If you're coming from VS Code, chances are you still will want the RStudio key map enabled because some of these options are not actually found, I believe, at the moment inside of the VS Code version of, of where the shortcuts are. So um, that's just a, a minor note. Okay, moving right along, let's actually enable this inside of Positron. So if we jump back into Positron, we, if we go to where the gear is in the lower left, and then we go to where settings is, notice that settings has a shortcut on Mac that's going to be command comma, on Windows that's going to be control comma. Go ahead and select settings. What will happen inside of settings is you'll have a pop-up page in the top left. We're going to go down to where you see extensions. Underneath extensions, we're going to scroll all the way down until we see where this RStudio key map is. And then all we need to do is check a single box. Lo and behold, we're all done. Go up to the top and you can press the X or you can use Command W or Control W to exit the setting menu. With that being done, we're now set to actually start the analysis portion. What I would suggest doing in terms of the analysis portion is not creating a new notebook, not creating a new file, but instead going into the new project wizard. And I would suggest selecting an R project uh, to actually create. Then I would go next. And in this particular case, what I would go ahead and do is I would call a project name uh, like demo data um, work. Next, what's going to happen here is we're going to want to allow the project name to be underneath the home user directory. On Mac, that's users, Ronin, and then over here, you can see it's just going to be demo-data work. And we're not going to initialize a Git repository. That will come at a later video if you're interested. We're just going to go ahead and press Next. We're going to say we want this default um, version of R. We're not going to enable any kind of reproducible environment using R environment because, again, this is meant to be a quick kind of project. And then what we're going to do is press Create. Now I'm going to press current window and what will happen is this entire current window will refresh. And lo and behold, on the left-hand side, what you see here is you see the Explorer um, uh, portion open. And inside of the Explorer portion, you actually see the project being listed. Down below where we see the R console, you'll notice that right above the R console, we have the exact path where the current working directory is. That is, if we type get wd, that's exactly where we are, which means that all of our files are going to be placed together. This is one of the huge reasons why I'm making this suggestion not to jump into a new file, not to jump into a new Jupyter RPAR notebook, or even a new console itself. This is sort of the one that you want to do for everyday use. So 
Going a little bit more forward, right, we have this untitled dash one. If I go ahead and I try and press these save buttons, unfortunately, nothing happens. What you have to do is you actually have to go up to where you see the file menu, and then you can go down to save. That basically is equivalent to using a keyboard shortcut of command S or control S if you're on Windows. So I'm gonna go ahead and now press command S, which is going to open a save prompt. And then what I'm going to call this is data wrangling.r, and then I'm going to save the file. So the second I do that, notice on the lower, on the left-hand side at the upper top, notice that there's now a data dash wrangling file. Meanwhile, on the upper top left of the editor window, right, we now have a named file. And if we mouse over where this uh, file is underneath, so that is one below the tab, we actually have a pathway to where the file is being kept. Now, one of the other things that I'm gonna do is I want as much screen real estate as possible. So I'm going to go ahead and close this Explorer. So when I close that Explorer, notice I get so much more screen real estate. Now, at any time I can open this, the Explorer by using a keyboard shortcut like Shift Command E, notice that the Explorer now opens. However, if I use Shift Command E again, notice that it doesn't disappear. So if you want to close the Explorer, you're going to have to use your mouse. I think this is one of the woes of having an early uh, beta. Next, what I wanna do is I want to actually take you through some of the features of this editor. So on that end, we're going to start with writing out a comment. So here you can do a comment like Shift and then uh, three to get that pound. And notice that this comment uh, just immediately starts to be uh, green. And I'm gonna use an enter to move to the next line. And then I'm gonna go ahead and start saying install.packages. And you'll notice as I type, basically I have IntelliSense uh, auto or autocomplete that comes up in terms of what are possible functions uh, that match what I've typed. If I go ahead and I press enter, it'll automatically complete it for me. Now, it also gives you a nice tool tip that basically shows you uh, what is happening in terms of the argument that you're trying to work on if you pause. So in this case, I've paused and I need to supply packages. So I'm going to supply a vector of packages. In this case, I'm interested in using dpliers, ggplot2, plotly, and then gt. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a keyboard shortcut command enter, which basically took this entire line of code and placed it right inside of the console in the lower left hand side and ran all of the code. Alternatively, I can press this play button at the top right and it'll save the script file and then source it directly into the console. The next part that I'm going to do is I'm going to actually describe the location of the data file I want. So what that means is I'm going to say URL of penguins is going to be equal to, in this case, https colon forward forward slash github.com forward slash coatless forward slash raw dash data forward slash raw forward slash main forward slash penguins dot CSV. That's a really long string. Don't worry about it. It's all available in the description down below. Now, if I mouse over this with my mouse, notice nothing happens immediately. Uh, it takes a little keyboard pop-up that basically says use command plus click. So if I now hold down command, notice that it switches from being a raw string, which is just green, into now being a URL. And if I go ahead and I click this link, it would take me to where this data is. But I'm not interested in doing that. Instead, we're gonna go ahead and just directly allow R to download the data using here download.file, in this case URL underscore penguins, and I'm gonna go ahead and press enter, notice autocomplete in action, and then I'm gonna go ahead and say penguins.csv. Next, we're going to go ahead and read the data in. So we're going to go ahead and say penguins, and we're going to say read.csv, parentheses, quotations, penguins.csv. Lo and behold, we next need to either um, run each line individually. So in this case, I'm gonna go up to the 
the line five, press command enter. And when I press command enter, notice on the right hand side underneath sessions, I now have a variable URL underscore penguins alongside of the value immediately appearing. And we can just, you know, make this a little bit longer so it's a little bit clearer. At the end, notice it describes what the uh, data type is. So in this case, that's a string that the URL is. And if I go one down uh, to the next line that is downloading the data, notice that effectively it quickly went ahead and downloaded the data. Um, now, one of the nice things is because again, we're inside of our project, we didn't have to set a directory, it automatically came into the current working directory. So if I go ahead and I open up this uh, Explorer tab again, using Command Shift E, notice that I now have penguins.csv. If I wanted to view what's going on inside of the data file, all you have to do is click on the file itself, and then the penguins.csv data file will gently open. You can actually get an extension that will make this CSV look a lot more, uh, a lot better. But um, again, I'm not trying to add additional extensions. I'm trying to show the capabilities that Puzzletron itself has at this exact moment. So I'm going to go ahead and close this file. And now what I'm going to do next is I'm going to read in the data. Um, and you're going to see on the right hand side, again, notice we have a new sort of header called data. And underneath that, we have the penguins data frame. And if I go ahead and I click on that little arrow to expand, notice that I sort of have species, island, uh, bill length, bill depth, flipper length, body mass, and then sex all present alongside of how many observations and how many variables. There's also this little button called a data viewer. So if I go ahead and I click it, I now go into this interactive data viewer. However, again, I need more screen real estate. So I'm going to go ahead and close out of that uh, Explorer by clicking on the um, Explorer icon in the top left. Now, let's spend a little bit more time looking at what's going on with respect to this interactive data explorer, which is, I think, really, really cool. On the left hand side, what we see is each of these variables, and we have either a letter, so in this case, A indicating a string, um, or we have a pound sign indicating a number, like a double and even an integer itself. So this is really nice. What we also have here is we sort of have a summary. So this summary is basically designed to sort of say how many missing data points there are, I think. Uh, because if you look over here in, in the actual table, you'll notice that there are quite a few NA values with bill length um, and basically uh, body mass. Um, and then there are even a few that are just totally missing in terms of the sex column itself. So in a case like this, there might be a slight issue again with how early this beta is, but I expect later beta versions to very quickly understand what's going on and, and also sort of address that. Now, another thing I want to do is I want to very quickly show just working with a data um, column. So here, if I go over to bill length and uh, underscore mm, right, I can do a few things. First is I can copy whatever the value is. I can select the entire column itself. Um, and I can also sort of change how order is being done. So here I can reorder everything. So sort descending, right? This effectively sorts all of the rows. How do I know that? If you look over on the left-hand side, notice that the row numbers are no longer in increasing order. Um, instead, they're all in, in basically the order with respect to what's going on with bill length. Now, again, this doesn't actually change how the data is sorted on disk. This is just part of the interactive data viewer that you're seeing. If I go back over here, right, and I unclick it and I say clear sorting, notice again on the left-hand side, all of the row IDs have returned to normal. So this is really nice. You can really quickly sort things, but the downside is unlike with our studio where if I double click, notice that I, I would have sorted in upper to lower, right? I actually sort of have to click once and then click another time to actually get to the descending. 
Um, you can also filter data directly inside of it. So here, right, if I go ahead and I click that, I can apply conditions. So I can say, I'm only interested in seeing values that are greater than, in this case, let's say 40, and then apply the filter. So notice that the entire data set itself gets subset. And in the top uh, portion, notice that this condition was added. Now, if I wanted to also add another uh, requirement, right? Let's say here that um, I wanted the sex of the penguin um, uh, to be equal to, uh, and then I want this to be, let's say, female. So I want to see all the female penguins. Notice that you can combine, and the com combination here very clearly says and, right? So it's a really nice interactive way of working with data is what I would say. And you can hide this filter if you want to avoid letting people know that you didn't write code. Um, or alternatively, you can also just clear all of the results. So lo and behold, you're back to your original uh, data frame as is. So this is a really nice part of the variables data menu portion that you're seeing. So Again, um, if I drag out my uh, bar a little bit, so right, dragging out the middle portion, you can actually see here the uh, data type alongside of the number of observations and a gentle sample. This would be sort of equivalent, I suppose, to looking at a glimpse with dplyr. So if I go ahead and gently um, uh, you know, view uh, data using glimpse, right? That would be dplyr colon colon glimpse. And then I can say penguins. And if I then uh, type or press command enter, what happens down below inside of the console is I now sort of have a transposed print of what is happening inside of the data frame, which is again, sort of a little bit similar to how you're viewing things underneath the data subsection of session. So moving a little bit more onwards, right? What happens if we want to look at the first five observations? Well, we would need to use in this case, head and then penguins. And if we go ahead and run head penguins, again, notice that we just get the first, not five, but six observations. Uh, if we wanted the first five, we would have to set n equal to five. And lo and behold, again, we get five observations. And by dragging out, um, again, uh, this bar, what happens is we're just changing how much width is out being given to the console so that we can see a nice output. If we go a little bit more downwards, right, um, another thing that we might want to do is check the last six observations. So we could just directly use tail and then penguins and then do command enter. And you can tell that again, uh, Positron is able to very easily handle printing. Now, if I go a little bit more downwards, right? Another part here would be, we might actually want to create a factor. So if we wanted to create a factor, right? We're looking at making a cast of sex to um, a factor, so that would be in this case penguins dollar sign sex underscore factor, and then we're going to say that's going to be equal to as dot factor uh, parentheses penguins dollar sign sex, and then command enter to run that line of code. And what happens is you can see on the right hand side the data frame gets updated with an additional column. So if I go ahead and I click again to see that being um, uh, expanded, we can see on the lower portion, there's a factor with three different levels. So one of the levels is missing and uh, or missing data outside of just the male, female, and then we have the appropriate number of observations. Now, instead of going back into this interactive data viewer over here, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to um, access the interactive data viewer um, by calling a function, which in this case is your usual view. So here, if I go view penguins, command enter, lo and behold, 
I get right into the exact same interactive data viewer as before, and I can actually see the sex factor over on the far right hand side. So again, it's really, really cool and really powerful in terms of what you can do by just having data in your environment and then look, aiming to look at it. So let's go a little bit more downwards, right? Um, how about a, a summary, right? So if we type summary and then penguins, and then we say command enter, lo and behold, again, all of the print width is respected. We sort of see exactly what we anticipate. Um, what if we go ahead and use a more interesting package? So in this case, um, what we want to do is we want to use skim r colon colon skim and then parentheses penguins. And if we go ahead and try and run that, you'll notice that we get our first error. So in this particular case, we're getting this error message saying there's no package called skim r. Not only do we have an error in the console, but when we were trying to use a package namespace call, notice that there's a really nice red text that appears that basically says the package skim r is not installed. You need to go ahead and install it. So what we'll really quickly do is add uh, another R package by basically saying install that packages, parentheses, and then skim R, command enter. Lo and behold, the package downloads, the error text underneath skim R disappears. And if we go ahead and press command enter, we have a wonderful output summary that's a lot more detailed and descriptive. Um, however, I think there's a, a few things that uh, might need to be gently changed upstream in the skim R package. But overall, it looks really, really nice and it handled it beautifully. A lot of what you're seeing here behind the scenes is actually being done with like a CLI package. Uh, so anything that you're seeing that was very feature rich inside of our studio, it, it definitely came over and is working inside of Positron which is really, really exciting and really, really good. So this is a more detailed uh, summary is what I should say. So if I go down a little bit more, right, the next part that we're sort of interested in is we're interested in seeing how data looks. So in a case like this, right, what we would aim to do here is load a library, um, and the library that we're interested in loading is going to be ggplot2. And notice that we get like a nice suggestion, right? So ggplot, and if I just say gm, so you have like gam or like gapminder. So it, it really is reading things quite nicely. Ideally, you know, uh, you might be able to, to, to even improve that, but that's outside of the scope here. So let's go ahead and say library ggplot2 and do command enter to load the library into the environment. Next, what we want to do is we want to graph the data using ggplot2. So here what we're going to do is we'll say ggplot, and then we'll say data equals penguins. We'll say plus, in this case, AES, parentheses, X equals flipper. So you'll notice here that it doesn't quite have the IntelliSense of the variable names inside of penguins though. So unlike uh, inside of our studio, you actually sort of have to type it out a little bit right now. Then what we're going to do is say comma y equals and then body underscore mass underscore g and then we're going to close the parenthesis and then add a plus uh, and we'll say we would like a geom underscore point parentheses and we want to add a color so aes again where we have the color equal to the sex variable. Now, if I put my mouse cursor at the end and I do command enter or control enter, notice that everything is immediately picked up. Similarly, if I mouse up or uh, keep arrow up to where ggplot is starting on line 41 and then rerun command enter, notice that everything sort of immediately is taken um, after each of the pluses, which is really exciting and nice. And on the lower right hand side, we get this really cool plot. Not only do we get a plot, but we also get a history panel. Now there's, there's not a lot of difference between the two because I basically rerun the same code twice, but let's go ahead and delete the previous one, right? Because it's exactly the same. 
And you'll notice that in this particular case, when we delete the previous one, the, the past plot history disappears, and we're just left with the last plot that we made. If we wanted to remove color in this case, so I'm just gonna put a gentle comment there and then rerun this portion of code by using command enter. Notice that we have two plots that are present and we can see the difference really nicely between the two plots. Not only that, what we can do is up at the top, if you're not happy with how it's automatically being displayed, we can actually change here, you know, um, the space bounds by selecting different options um, that the developers thought would be useful. Uh, another part that you can do is you can go backwards. So again, you don't have to use here this little bar that's on the right hand side, but you can go you know, backwards, forwards, exactly like that, or just click between the two versions. Another part that you can do here is you can also delete, in this case, all of the plots by going to the top right and clicking clear all plots. Um, you can also sort of uh, describe whether or not you want the plot history. So, oops, I cleared it too soon. So if I very quickly rerun this, right, and I go um, uh, and I add here just the black and white plot, and then I add the color plot, notice that instead of having auto, I can just say never, and I'm stuck just using the back and forth arrows, uh, which is very similar to um, RStudio. However, with auto, again, if there's space, right, it'll appear. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means that you really have to make your editor window very, very small for the for um, those history plots to not be picked up. Okay, let's go a little bit more forward. The other thing that I wanted to really do is I wanted to show a quick demo of plotting interactively. So if we go plotly and then we say ggplotly parentheses and then do command enter, ho, oh, we actually have an HTML widget that is being plotted inside of the uh, plot window. And if I mouse over, we have basically all of the points that are identifiable alongside of what the values were for these given points. We can zoom in to a specific range and we can sort of zoom out using here what's going on on the top action bar. We can also go auto scale, which just sort of, you know, makes sure that a lot of the points are present and we can further press the home button to just return to the original axis. Now, there's a few other components, but it's really, really nice. The part that's not great right now is it looks as if it's taking a screenshot of the entire Positron um, window instead of just focusing for the this specific thumbnail on the ggplot or the uh, plotly uh, graph that you're seeing here. And if we go again down, notice on this history panel, we, we still have the ability to jump between the previous plots, which I think is just amazing. So this again is just allowing us to really nicely create an interactive uh, graph. Okay, so the last example that I wanted to really quickly go through and do is I wanted to um, create basically a table uh, using GT because GT is one of the more uh, feature rich uh, HTML uh, table creation packages. So here, if we go ahead and say count penguins by species, where they reside uh, and their sex, right? Um, we're looking at a dplyr call that would be very similar to the following penguins. And then um, I can use in this particular case, a pipe statement. So I can go ahead and say command shift M to create a R4.1, uh, I think, an above pipe operator. And then I can say here like dplyr group underscore by parentheses species island sex underscore factor. And then I can say command shift M uh, again to create that pipe operator. Uh, it, it, on Windows, that would be control shift M. And then for the last line, let's say dplyr uh, colon colon count. And I'm just going to quickly run that line of code. And notice when I run that line of code from the top, uh, I now have a new data frame that was added called penguin underscore count. And it's a group data frame. And I can expand it out. And you can sort of see what's going on. 
Or alternatively, I can just say penguin underscore count and press command enter. And lo and behold, in the um, lower uh, console, we can effectively see, you know, a table um, where we have counts of the species, the island, and then the sex of the penguin. So going down a little bit more, let's take this um, count data. And what we want to then do um, is uh, basically, again, pipe it into, let's say, GT. And lo and behold, on the right-hand side, notice instead of being underneath the plot, we're now under the viewer. And if we jump back to where session is, again, all of the previous graphs, all of where our data is, it's all being kept. But anything that's a lot more feature um, rich in terms of HTML widgets, I think is going to show up more under this viewer uh, window. Okay. And oh, I totally forgot. I, I'm, I'm, I should have done this in, in the beginning, but you can actually access help files for the package. So if I do question mark GT and then colon colon GT and then do command enter, lo and behold, this help tab over here ends up appearing and you get the entire documentation uh, article uh, that gets pulled up. And it's, it also allows for hyperlinks between packages. Um, if you click the home button though, it doesn't seem to want to do anything, which is a little bit odd. Um, if you scroll down a little bit more, uh, you can even press the run examples button and lo and behold, uh, on the right hand side, you now sort of have the examples being run inside of that help window. Uh, if you press back again, notice you'll, you'll go back to the static, um, examples. And then last but not least, again, you can always access the dplyr package uh, documentation index, um, but it looks as if that might not be the case for this one. Oh, well, as you can imagine, there's a lot of exciting things that you can do inside of Positron, um, but looking at a package help documentation index does not seem to be the, the right one. But hopefully uh, that sort of satisfies your appetite for how you can actually go through and do things inside of Positron with an R uh, analysis script workflow. Uh, later videos, I'll probably do something with using packages and then also databases and oh, more advanced things. But thank you guys so much for watching. I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye now.